All right, everybody, welcome to a new chapter, 6.1. We're gonna be dealing with these things called exponential functions. And to get us started, we're gonna have some definitions of what to look for. Now, this should be some terminology that is familiar. As of late, we've been talking a lot about what kinds of things, uh, maybe a pandemic or two, right? And with that, slowing the curve because this thing was growing exponentially, all right? And so what we're gonna be talking about is these exponential functions and how they Sorry, I had to clear that off. Um, and how they uh, grow, what we want to know and be able to find and use these things for. So bear with me here. A lot of this hopefully will be familiar from either your algebra two or high school days, whatever uh, you remember from exponents, exponential functions and logs, logarithms, okay? We're gonna talk about two different types, exponential growth and decay and how we're gonna look and be able to see whether it's gonna grow or decay is going to be with this function here. We are calling an exponential function, okay? And of all the parts of this exponential function, we're gonna be talking about one key thing in particular. And if you guys recognize why they called it an exponential function, was that our variable, our unknown, which we usually call x, is up in the exponent, okay? But what is the most important thing in an exponential function? As Megan Trainer told us, it's all about that base, okay? Then there's no trouble, I mean trouble. So if you remember, this base here is what we need in order to have an exponent. So a long time ago, we learned how to add the same number a bunch of times right? So much so that we said, you know what, let's just call it times it. And we'd have four, or excuse me, our two, four times. But then if we multiplied by that same number a bunch of times, well, then we wanted a shortcut for that as well. And we said, well, what do we have? It's that two again, but we have to write it differently than this. So to let you know that it's multiplying by that thing a bunch of times, rather than adding that thing a bunch of times, we created this thing called an exponent. And we wrote it up in the corner, upper right corner of our base, the thing that we have a bunch of times. So how do we tell if something is growing or decaying? Obviously we know it's exponential when we have a variable up in the exponent. It's all about that base. And if that base what we always want to compare everyone to is ourselves, all right? So we're gonna compare everything to one. And if there's a base that is bigger than one, then we know it's going to grow or increase. So the alternative would be to be less than one. But there is a caveat to this. We cannot have a base in our exponential function that is zero or negative. And why do you guys think we can't have a zero? Because it doesn't equal to zero, because you can't equal to zero, like kind of like uh, if you divide something uh, it's hard to explain, but it basically can't equal to zero. Dustin, were you going to add something? No. What if I chose any number? I asked every single one of you to give me your favorite number, and that's what I plugged in for X to see what I got out for Y. What would the result be for every single one of you? Zero. Yeah, very good, Drew. Because we know zero to any power is going to spit out zero. And if we were to graph that, then that would just be this line where y is equal to zero for any x. Well, that's a line. 
That's not what an exponential function is going to look like if it were a two or a five or a 25. So yeah, zero's out. We can't have that because it doesn't behave like all the others. And we wanna classify all of these similarly, okay? With all of these things that we're talking about here. But what about negatives? You said if B is bigger than one, then it would be an exponential growth or increasing function. But if it was less than one, we're thinking, all right, well, then that's going to be less. It's going to decay. Because give me an answer. What, what is something less than one? Negative one. Negative one. Okay, good. Somebody put zero. Somebody said negative one. Well, guys, remember, we can't have zero. And not only can we not have zero, we can't have a negative one. Because what if I said negative one to the x? And I ask you to give me some x values, like zero, one, two, three, or negative one, negative two, negative three. What are my outputs? What are my y values going to be? Some of them are going to be positive one. Some of them are going to be negative one. Depends on whether or not this is even or odd. And so if I was to graph that at one, two, three, four, I'd have a negative one and then positive one, negative one, positive. What does the graph of that look like? The sine curve? Sine. Sine curve. <laughs> yeah, cosine. No, no, no. We want all of these to look the same. So negatives, zero, all that is out, which means we are also going to put this caveat that our B has to be greater than zero. So what does it mean to decay or decrease as a function? Give me some values between zero and one. What kinds of things are they gonna be in one word? It's an F word, I'll give you that, but careful. Fraction. Oh, thank you, very good. Fraction. I was gonna say decimal, but. Good, decimal or fraction. Just remember, it has to be a fraction less than one. Don't let them fool you and say it's five-fourths. That's actually one and a quarter. That's going to grow a little bit at a time, but it will grow. Okay? So what we're going to get into in the second section is what these things look like. Talk about the graphs. We'll talk about these domain and range values. We'll talk about what happens if we have a leading coefficient or if anything is negative. And do you guys remember all the graphing things that we did last unit? All that HK vertex stuff, whether they were absolute values, squared, quadratic functions, cubic, square root, all those other types that we learned, a lot of that is going to stay the same. I'll be using the same terminology and approaches, okay? We'll talk about intercepts, domains, and range, all that fun stuff yet again, all right? So we're going to use this thing called the one-to-one -one property of exponential functions in order to solve exponential equations. And what does that mean? Well, if I have an exponential function and it's equal to another exponential function, for example, what does this mean right here? Equals. Good. So if I have an exponential function equals an exponential function, what does equals really mean? It's a big push across the universe right now, right? What does it mean? Same. What is? What are values? How about everything? In order to be equal, it has to be the exact same. And by it, we mean everything on the left side as the right. And what do we already see? 
that sometimes will be the same already are base. And if those are already the same, then what we're going to do is we're just going to drop them. We're not getting rid of them, but what do we already know? That those are equal, which means what does also have to be equal if these already are? Your exponents. Very good, which they're just calling S and T. Okay, some other function. So if we have a scenario like this, where I have five to a power, what would I want on the other side? Five, five with something to, to power. Very good. I would like it to be five to a power as well. But the problem is we have five to a power here, which is easy. But I notice this side over here, I can also write as five to a power, can't I? This 25, I can rewrite as a different looking 25. Does everybody agree that that's still 25? But don't forget, I also had a 3x plus 2 up there, didn't I? So be careful. You got to remember some of your exponent rules. Do you guys remember exponent rules? If not, we will be reviewing those next week. But what do we do when we have a power to a power? They add. Careful. That means x times x times x times x times x, which means I have x times itself five times. And a big mistake is people just multiply those because they see multiply, right? But like Dustin said, we will add. Same thing if we're dividing, we'll subtract. And I'll go over this next week, but what happens if I had x squared and that was cubed? What does it mean whenever we have something to a power? I just reviewed it with you all. Times itself, that many times. Very good, which means I'd write it like this. And what happens to be inside of there that we have cubed? The x squared, which means I have x squared this many, what did you say, Jenny? What word? That many times. And that's why in elementary school, we called multiplication, which is a mouthful, timesing. Because it literally means that we have this that many times. And like Dustin said before, I could then sit here and add two plus two plus two X's that I could write out all multiplying times themselves and get the six. Or I could bypass writing all of that out and just say, whenever I have a power raised to a power, we can simply what? Multiply. I know a lot of you despise math because you're like, there's so much of it. But remember, a lot of it is shortcuts, trying to help you get simple or simplify things. Okay? Drew still doesn't believe me. He's like, no, no, not simpler. There's a lot, I know. So re remember where we started with this was that we had a power of two to another power. And all we did was rewrite our 25 so that this side now has a base of five and this side has a base of five. This side had the two X, which we didn't have to deal with because we could get this one. We do have to rewrite this carefully and get six X plus four. And what did we say this meant? Don't just say equal. What did it mean? The same. And what had to be the same, Dust? One side to the other. Very good. Everything. One side to the other, which means since I already know that these are equal, I'm going to focus on the exponents also being equal. And I will take that equation. 
and I will now solve. Just like I told you, the secret sauce to mathematics, all of mathematics is getting a single equation with a single variable so that we can solve it. And we had to do some arm waving to do it, but we are now there. Okay, that's the easy part. However you want to do it, subtract the 2x and the 4 to work with a positive x or a negative. You're going to end up with it either way. 4x on one side, negative 4 on the other. And at this point, you can stop and tell me the answer is what? Negative 1. Beautiful. How do you know if that's right? Plug and check. Yep. You could actually go and plug in negative 1 there for x and there and make sure that it is indeed a true statement or plug it into our homework and it'll tell you right or wrong immediately okay so this is the kind of stuff that we will be doing some easier than others but i wanted to show you one that's kind of in the middle all right hopefully it wasn't too difficult that you could follow along and hopefully it was a little bit more challenging than something that already has common bases all right how else do we use exponential functions? Well, I don't know if you guys have uh, ever heard of a fellow by the name of uh, Albert uh, Einstein. Few people have, all right? He actually said one of the most important discoveries in all of mathematics is this formula, compound interest. I'm sure most of you have a bank account and you probably have some money in it. That means that you're accruing what is called interest. And it is compounding, meaning that whatever interest you earn, that now then also starts earning interest. Now, if you've ever looked at your savings or checking account and you looked at what pittance they give us, it's pretty sad. It's like 0 0.01 of a percent in your checking account. It's really, really bad, okay? Which is why the banks always win because they have all the money and then they hand it out to us at a much, much higher rate. And then they give us for allowing us to lend out the money that we have with them. They give us just a little fraction of it. And so they're making way more, right? I'm sure some of you guys have car loans. If you have a vehicle and you have a loan out on it, I'm sure your rate is very high compared to what you're earning in your bank account. And if you wanted to know how much, this is what you would use, okay? P stands for principal, how much you put in. The one is there because when you multiply that, you have to have 100% of your principal that you put in. But plus, you're going to end up having a little bit more, aren't you? And that more is going to depend on two things. One, the most important thing is called the rate. And that rate is usually pretty high if you're borrowing or really low if you're earning. And that's why banks win, right? Now, don't forget my dad actually wrote an article on this in the Fresno Bee, and I posted that in the files in our Canvas tab, okay? If you guys wanted to check it out and talk a little bit more about this and loans, all right? Otherwise, the N stands for the number of times that they're gonna compound or pay or charge you the interest. And T always typically stands for time. And that can be in years, months, days, hours, minutes, seconds, whatever. And if you guys were earning interest, when would you want to earn it? How often? Once a year? Annually? How about twice Every a month. year? Every month. Semi-annually. Every month? That's what most people pay out, right? Most banks, every month you get a statement. 
So that means they're only paying you 12 times a year. And of course, that fluctuates based on the average in those 30 days or so. What would be better than once a month? Every day. You know what I can do you on better, Brian? How about every hour of every day? Yep. Every minute? Every second. How about every second of every second, Drew? How would we say that instead of every second? What does that mean you're earning interest? It's called continuously. You are continuously now, 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 pay me, pay me, pay me. Constantly, continuously earning interest, which means the rate might not change. The number of years that you hold your money and the amount of money that you initially put in may not change. But what about that in? The number of times we get paid a year. We said if it was monthly, it'd be 12. Daily, 365 in a year. We won't count the one-fourth. Could we figure out hourly, minutely? We could do the math on it. But what about continuously? What do you think we'd have to use for N? Infinity, maybe? I don't know. Yeah, very good, Drew. Excellent. A really, really, really big number. Because we're constantly, continuously being paid. So it's like, remember the limit stuff we talked about with asymptotes and such? It's like we would be putting in infinity there and calculating that. And that's weird. And that's where this gets a little wonky. And that's where luckily we don't have to deal with it. Because this Swiss mathematician by the name of Leonard Euler is how you say his name. Notice his name starts with an E and check out the dates. He was very interested in what Einstein said was one of the most important discoveries in all of mathematics. And he figured out that as that in increases without bound or approaches infinity, like Drew said, what's really weird was it all approached the exact same number always. And you want to know what that number was? It was E. You're like, that's not a number, bro. That's a letter. Well, remember, just like pi was discovered by taking, remember the circumference, the distance around a circle? It's equal to pi times the diameter, which is through the center and any two points on it. Well, if we want to know what pi is, we just have to divide by d. And that's what they discovered a long time ago, was that this also always kicked out the exact same number. The problem is, you guys know, everything in life doesn't work out perfect, does it? Unfortunately, that number, pi we called it, didn't work out well. It wasn't a nice fraction. It wasn't a really good decimal. It wasn't a really nice number. It was called an irrational number. And you guys remember pi as approximately 3.14. All right, I'll stop. Never ends, never repeats. So you know it as three-ish. A little bit more than three. Well, remember how we spell pi is actually pi. What happened to the E? Well, there it goes right there. The reason they say that they use the number or the letter E for this number is either because the guy who kind of discovered it or because it comes from an exponential function. So that's where they think the E came from. I think it came from the pi, and then they just use it here because they also borrowed it from the three. 
because you want to know what E is? It's a little less than three. Now I'm making these little jokes so that you hopefully will remember that E is a little less than three and pi is a little more than three. So if we were to take what we know, this whole thing, as we get it continuously compounded, then we get to replace all of this with E, but we're still gonna have to have the R and the T for our rate and our time. So if you notice, what ends up happening is that we will get this. formula, which is what we say compounded continuously. Now, what I like to say is that it's continuously. That's when you know that you're going to use the E formula versus the other one. Okay. Continuously will be the one that you use the E. All right, all other, you'll use this formula. All right, so that is what we're going to be doing in this section. Solving equations and using it to figure out different monetary values. So for this one, read it. We got a thousand bucks that we're going to invest and we're going to earn 10% a year. That's really, really, really good right now. All right. And it's compounded continuously. As soon as I see this, I know I'm using the formula. My amount will be based on the principle that I put in times E to the RT power. And how many variables do I have in this formula? Close. Good. A lot of people will say five. One, two, three, four, five, because they see five letters. But remember, this is a number. So in reality, we only have one, two, three, four unknowns or variables. And what do we hope that they ask us to find? Very good. People put in the chat, A. And sometimes they'll just write A, sometimes they'll write A of T, the amount after a certain time. Because if they ask us to find that, then they're gonna have to tell us all of this. It's already set up to find it. Beautiful. And in this case, they wanna know how much was in the account at the end of one year. Perfect. I know they want the ending amount. So they're gonna to have to tell me how much I put in, the rate and the time. And of those things, they told us we invest a thousand bucks at a rate of 10%. Now, do you like putting in percentages there? No, you have 0 0.10. Very good. And how do you know it's 0 0.10, Dustin? Because that's a, ten, that's a tenth of one. Very good. Remember what per cent means. It means per 100. And if we have 10%, then we have 10 out of 100. Or 10 hundredths. Or if you want to divide by 10, one tenth. Like you said. Point one. Okay, most people will just take the percent and to get rid of it, they'll move their decimal two places away. But the reason is because you're dividing by 100. Okay, then the time, they said one year. Doesn't get much easier than that. All you're gonna have to do is locate where your E is and make sure you forder, uh, excuse me, follow your order of operations. Okay, all good with that? 
Anybody punch that in? Tell me what they got. I chose easy numbers. Just so that you can see the setup. What do you know it should be more than? It should definitely be more than a thousand bucks. Otherwise, you screwed up, right? I said 1105.17. Very good. And make sure that you get all of your change. Okay. So I did E to the 0.1 and then I multiplied it by the thousand. And that's what I got was $1,105.17. If you wanted to figure out how much you would make in your actual bank, then you'd have to use the other formula and use in as 12 for your monthly payments if you were able to get that 10% rate. So what if they asked how much did we make in interest? What would you do to that? Subtract a thousand. Very good. Take away your principal and you would say you earned a whopping hundred and five dollars and 17 cents at 10 percent my friends continuously compounded every second of every second you guys only get it once every month at 0 0.01 of a percent do the math on that and you'll see how little you're really getting by putting it in the bank and leaving it there yeah, it's safe, but that's about all it is, okay? Learn how to invest, use the stock market, things like that. You can hopefully overcome the banks a little bit more. Never beat them, but hopefully not pay them back as much. All right, well then let's talk about the graphs of these things. How are we gonna graph an exponential function? Well, remember this is just my y equals two to the x. And if I don't know what something looks like, I always do a little thing called a T-chart where I plot points. And this one is obviously set up to see what Y is equal to. So we're going to choose X values. And what's one of our favorite things to plug into equations? Zero. Excellent. I'm going to start by plugging in zero. And careful, what do we say anything to the zero power is? One. Ooh, good. Yeah. And remember, it's really easy to prove. If I have five cubed over five cubed, then I know I have a certain number of fives. And if I do three minus three, some of those exponent rules I told you we would review, then I'd have five to the zero. Well, if I want to know what that's equal to, what is anything divided by itself? One. One. So since I know that this is equal to one, which is equal to this, which is equal to this, then these have to be the same. That's a quick little proof as to why anything to the zero is one. Other than, what if I did this? What is zero to the zero? That's just, oh, you just raise your voice. No, exponents. When you raise them to the power, it doesn't mean you raise your voice, okay? We cannot divide by zero, so this is something you have to wait to figure out in calculus. All right. So we know that anything to the zero power is one, which means what did we just find? What does this represent? Vertex. Good. That quote-unquote vertex, that is my starting point. That is an ordered pair, that zero, one, right there. Anybody know what it looks like yet? Mm, might need some more points, right? So what else is easy to plug in? One. <laughs> one, two. How about negative one and negative two? Those also be pretty easy? Yep. Should be. Because we know 
when I plug in a one for X, what does two to the first give me out for my Y? Two. And what happens when I put two to the second? What is two squared? Four. Can you guys see the pattern? What if I put in a three, what would happen? Nine. Careful. Or sorry, sorry. <laughs> to eight. Very good, it's okay. Two to the third would be eight. How about two to the fourth? 16. How about two to the fifth? 32. How are you getting that so quick, Drew? That's, that's really good. Are you in Ireland? Ireland, no. Because it looked like you were just doubling every time. I got Dustin. I knew I'd get him on that one. Look, what did you do to get that? You doubled it. What did you do to get that? You doubled it. You doubled it to get the eight. You doubled that to get the 16 and then the 32. How should you know that every single one of these, as our X's get bigger, our Y's were doubling? I told you all, it's all about that base. The base tells us how this is behaving. It's doubling every single time as our X's get bigger, which represents a new point. One, two. Now, if I drew that, it would be a line. I know this is not a line. It's not Y equals MX plus B. Okay. Two, four. I would have missed if I drew that line. And therefore, it has to have some what to it. We call it curvature. But what happens on the other side? Does it hit this and go back up? Is it a parabola? Is this a parabola equation? It approaches zero. Good. A parabola equation was when it was x squared, not 2 to the x. Right? All the things that we've talked about in the last unit. How did you know it was going to approach zero, Brian? Well, guys, remember I said it was doubling each time? What happens if we went the other direction? Our X has got smaller. Instead of doubling, what would we have to do to go backwards? Have. Uh, Very good. So I know that this, if I took one and I took a half of that, and then half of that, and then half of that, and half of that. By the way, guys, what happens when you take half of something? What are you always left with? Uh, another half or a quarter? Yeah, very good. Not going to be a quarter. It depends on what you took half of if you'd be left with a quarter. But every time you took half of something, you're always going to be left with the other half, aren't you? And the reason I bring that up is I'm going to blow your freaking mind right now. You guys ready? On our number line, we started with nothing. And when we went to the right, we knew it was positive. Left, we knew it was negative. And where does it stop? How many numbers exist in this world? All of them. Uh, what does that mean, Brian? I like the answer. Infinity and negative infinity. Okay. Those aren't numbers, though. Smarty pants. Would those, it be are the e? those are ideas, right? And the idea, like you said, that all of them, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger to the right and bigger and bigger and bigger to the left. Well, then, how many numbers are there between zero and one? An infinite amount. Between zero and one? Yeah. I don't understand. Why? Because you could do point zero 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 one point zero 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 one two. Okay. I like that reasoning. Very good, Jenny. Let me give you a better way to visually see it. All right. I like that analogy. Very good. What if I took half? Well, then you know that this half is gone, and now I have this half, correct? 
And what would happen if I took half of that? And then half of that. And then half of that. And half of that. And half of that. What did you just get done telling me I would have every time I took half of something? I have the other half. Which means, will I ever run out of things? I'll always have something. Half of something is always half of something, isn't it? But what is it approaching? Approaches zero, but never hit, actually reaches zero. And what did we call those types of things? It's an asymptote. Watch your mouth, Dustin. Very good. That is right. So hopefully you saw when we put a negative one up here, what is two to a negative one? Do you guys remember what we did with negative exponents? Flip it. To make them happy again, we had to move them to the opposite side of our division bar. So that would now take this and move it down and become two to the positive one or one half. And how about two to the negative two? Same thing, one over two to the positive two or one fourth. And that, my friends, is that concept that we talked about, a limit, which is the first thing that you guys will see when you start dealing with calculus. Okay? So we will have that, what is called a horizontal asymptote, as Dustin mentioned, and therefore, all asymptotes, as some of you guys were doing incorrectly last unit when I was asking on that group quiz what the asymptotes were, whether they were vertical, horizontal, or even slant asymptotes, what are all of those? Lines. And therefore, you need to give me the what of those lines in order for me to know exactly where and what it looks like. The equation. Very good. And if it's this, what's true about a vertical asymptote? X equals. Because all the Y's can be different, but X is going to be here or here everywhere. And if it's a horizontal asymptote, then the X's can be whatever, but then the Y's would all be the same. And if it's got some slant to it, that means it has some slope. slope and therefore, we would use the slope intercept form. Very good, Jenny and everyone. So the horizontal asymptote will be where y is equal, in this case, to zero. Remember, we called that the end behavior. Some of you guys just put positive or negative infinity. You just closed your eyes and picked one. No, that's not what it ends up as always. Okay, this one is approaching zero. As I tried to show you, improve, as Ginny mentioned, an infinite amount of numbers just between zero and one, okay? So what if my base was one half? With the positive exponents, it would just double the bottom number and it would actually exponentially increase it. So two, four, eight, 16, 32. But with the negatives, it would actually start becoming a whole number. So it become 2, 4, 8, 16. Very good. And by the way, Dustin, everyone, I could actually have taken this. And instead of having the 1 half, all I would have to do, instead of making it an actual 1 half to the x and graphing that now, I could actually check this out. Just put a negative up there, couldn't I? Because what does a negative exponent do to our base? Flips it. It's called the? Reciprocal. Very good, Jenny. Reciprocal. And do you guys remember what happened when we threw negatives on our graphs? Is that being done to the x? Is it up there with the x? It's up there with the X. So it's going to affect all the X values, which means it's going to have a mirror image or reflection 
for all of these x values, they'll now come over here. And all of these x values will come over here to the opposite side. Remember, that's what this meant in words, was opposite. Now, if it was down here with the 2, is that being done to the x? Nope. So therefore, it would affect my y's, which means now my y values would go to the opposite side, and it would look like this. But this one, it's being done to the x, which I could either write it like this or like this. And remember what we said when our base is less than one? What do we say it would be if our base is less than one? Uh, decreasing, right? Very good. Now notice when our base was bigger than one, from left to right, as my X's got bigger, my Y's got bigger, didn't they? So this is what is called an increasing graph from left to right. But if we threw that negative on, then all of my X's would flip to the opposite side, from the negative side to the positive side, or the positive side to the negative side. And what would it look like? Do you guys see the mirror? All of this went over here, and all of this went over there. Or, as Dustin was mentioning, we could just take this thing and actually rewrite it as this and plug in all of these X's again. But this would still be there, which is why I'm going to give it the name that Drew did, and I'm going to call it that important point, the vertex. That's going to be my starting point. And then because I know that this right here, that one half is decreasing, I know that if I put in a one, I would only go up a half. And if I put in a negative one, it would flip it and I would get two. And that's enough for me to pretty much graph this thing. Because I want you guys to be able to graph these things like that as quickly as possible. Because guess what we're going to end up doing with these? We're going to end up picking them up and moving them around and setting them back down. We call them translations. We're going to stretch them and shrink them down. We're going to flip them either about the y-axis or the x-axis by throwing these negatives places. And that's what we'll end up doing when we start graphing these things. But just like we did last unit when we talked about the absolute values, the square roots, the cubic, the quart, uh, quadratic, all those different functions, we had to learn their parent functions first before we could shift them around. Okay. So here are a few characteristics if you want to pause it at this juncture and write any of this down. But the key things are, I wanted you to notice the domain. We could plug in anything. Right? Why can we plug in anything? Because we're just dealing with some number to a power. And we can plug in 0, 1, 2, or negative 1, negative 2, any of those things. Domain. Everything on my graph is covered, whether it's an increasing or decreasing function, which, remember, the base tells us which is which. The range, however, if you notice, is not completely covered. From left to right, negative infinity to positive infinity, all the x values are accounted for. But my range from smallest to biggest, I don't start hitting until I get to what value? Zero. And remember that zero would not be included, which is why there is a parenthesis around it. OK. 
Okay, but it would shoot up to infinity for all of my y values. Notice there is sometimes not an x intercept, but there is going to be a y intercept. How do we find intercepts always? If you want to find the x, let y be zero. If you want to find the y, let x be zero. None of that has changed. Okay. So a few little pieces of notes, and then we'll get into the last two sections, which I can now go a lot faster through because I've laid the foundation with these exponentials. All right. If you want to create a table of points, go for it. Eventually, I don't want you guys to. Okay. Once you plot those points, you draw your curve and remember domain, range, all the stuff that they might ask you for, make sure you answer, okay? But what do we want to be able to do eventually? We want to shift that parent graph. And remember the parent graph, the base is the most important. And if we have something being done to the X, do you guys remember what we did for the X? Opposite. Very good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write it just like we had in the last unit, I'm going to write the HK stuff. And so our quote unquote vertex, I'll write the whole thing out, or shift is going to be by that HK. And remember, we're going to do the opposite. And then same. X is one of the opposite of us. That's why we're going to take the opposite. That's why they're X's. Okay. The Y is Y's. We're going to do what it says. And so there's a little bit of things that you can kind of look at there or write down. But again, if you understand the shifting is all the same type of stuff that we did before with all those other functions that h comma k is going to be our shift. Just remember, it is no longer from 0, 0. It is not at the origin anymore. Remember, our vertex is at that 0, 1 point that they each have in common, like Drew said. We're going to grab that point and move it left 3, up 2, and then draw. Which means what else is going to shift? That horizontal asymptote. Okay. And I would always advise you to shift or watch your asymptote before you start moving your vertex or graph around. Okay. You want that borderline before you plot and graph. All right. Don't forget there are stretches and compressions that could happen as well. And that's when instead of adding or subtracting, we end up multiplying or dividing. Now, notice it's still going to be a measurement compared to one. And if it's greater than one, it's going to be stretched. If it's less than one, it's going to be compressed down. It's going to move slower, half as fast, rather than five times as quickly. And notice they have the absolute values around it. What are they saying to look at only? A. Yeah, the value of A, not whether it's positive or negative. If it's negative, then that's going to create what is called a reflection. And if it's being done to the B out in front, is it affecting the X? No. Therefore, it is going to affect our Y values. And if all of our Ys are being, what one word did we say this negative represented? Opposite. Very good. If it's affecting the y's, then it's going to go about the x-axis, positive to negative, opposite, or negative to positive, opposite. Where if it's being done to the x up here, then it's going to go about the y-axis. All my x's will go to the opposite side. Okay, that's what we mean by reflections. Looking in that mirror, either the x or y-axis. Right. So 
to sum it all up, this is the form that they are giving in the book. I don't like it. What I would prefer you guys to write instead of this is our f of x equals, can have any coefficient in front, but the most important part is our base. And it will be raised to an x, which is why it's called an exponential function. I would rather you write, and let me bold it here, negative h plus k. Because then we can use it and be more familiar with how we did it all of the previous functions in the previous unit. All right? So if you want it broken down piece by piece, that is here. The shifts only, the stretching and compressing only, which has to do with the A in front, the reflections of one or the other, and then all together. Okay, if you wanted any parts of that for your notes. So if I gave you something like this, I want you to be able to look at that and graph it quickly. What kind of function is this? Exponential. Definitely exponential. What kind? Give me something more. You like a good exponential? Oh, no, what kind of exponential? What does it all depend on? The x value. I didn't hear you, Dustin. I'm sorry. The x value. Close. That's going to be the shifting. Remember, I made the joke. It's all about that base. And I make these little jokes so that it'll stick, even if you think it's stupid. All right. It's all about that base. The base is going to tell me whether it's an increasing exponential or a decreasing exponential. Then it's decreasing. Careful. The base is two, which means it's bigger than one. So it's going to double each time, right? Then it's going to shift by what? Would it be plus one because it's the minus one? Very good, Drew. And three. Good. Now, if you wanted to put that in words, you would say shift right one and up three. And what are we shifting right one and up three? The vertex. Technically, everything. But yes, you're right, Drew. We're just going to take the asymptote and the vertex, move those. Draw it, be done. Okay, I don't need you to get out a bunch of points and do all the, make it quick and easy. Show me that you know what the basic shape of this looks like and we're good. Okay, so as long as you know that without these, we have that y equals two to the x that I did first with you all, which is this point and doing this with that asymptote. We're going to take those parts and we're going to shift it right one, up three. And what did I tell you to shift first? Asymptote. Very good. So just in case you want it, there's the two to the x. We needed to do these things to that, which means I'm going to take my asymptote and I'm going to shift it. Ready? Right one. Done. Can you see it? I shifted it right one. It runs left and right. So does it really matter that I shifted it left or right one? That's not going to affect my asymptote because it runs left and right. What is only going to affect it? How much up or down? So in this case, I will have to go up one, two, three, and draw my new x-axis. Does everybody see how I just shifted it up three? Then, as Drew mentioned, what are we next going to move up? The vertex. Now, don't forget the vertex. This is where most people make a mistake. They will put it at the origin. 
and they will start at the origin because that's what we've always done. Always, every function started there pretty much, right? And they would go right one and up three. Guys, what would we be lying on right now? The asymptote. Yeah. And by definition, what is the asymptote? Our what line? Limit? I don't know. It's our border line. It's what our equation, our graph borders or approaches, like you said, Jenny, the limit. So no, it can't be right there. Because remember, it was at zero, one. So again, just be careful with that. Don't start at the origin. If you need to plot that point, like I did in dark red, then go right one, up one, two, three. That's where. You should be plotting your point. Then what are you going to do? Draw your increasing graph and you're done. That's all I want to see. And based on that, then they wanted the domain, the range, and the equation of that asymptote. And who can tell me? what the domain is. That's just negative, negative infinity to infinity. Very good, everyone. How about the range? Three to infinity. Ah, very good, Dustin. And remember, three was not included. That was our borderline. That's what it said it approached. And how about the asymptote? What did Jenny remind us? I is equal to three. Very good. It's an equation. It's a line. And Dustin said that the X's can be whatever, but all of my Y values had to be up three. See how important this value actually is? We used it a couple times, didn't we? Cool. Hopefully that's not too bad. Hopefully you felt very good about how to graph that and quickly because I want you to be able to do that and or answer any of these things without graphing it and just seeing that visual in your head. All right, on to the last two sections, which are logarithms. So 6.3 here is going to introduce what a log is, and then we'll kind of go through it very quickly, and then we'll graph these things and then call it good for today, all right? Log functions. You guys all remember what this meant? Well, then Addition. once we learn how to add, we wanted to learn how to undo adding. So what do we create? Subtraction. One less line, subtraction. Then when we got so good at those, we said, you know what? We can add the same number a bunch of times. And we're just going to take that addition and we're going to turn it a little bit and we're going to call it timesing or multiplication. But then when we got good at that, we said, well, we got to undo that. So when we got to algebra, we put a dot. So that's what they did was they just put two dots on both sides of the subtraction. They called it division. What am I getting at here? Everything that we knew how to do. It always had its kryptonite, its counterpart, what we call the fancy math term. Anybody? What are these all to one another? Looking for one word. Reciprocals. Ooh, close. Opposite. Those often get mixed up. Mirror. <laughs> Inverse. Ah, there it is. Very good, Brian. You were close, Drew. They are inverses of each other because if you want to undo adding, you subtract. You want to undo dividing, you multiply. You want to undo squaring, you square root. Cubing, cube root. Fourth root, fifth root. Well, what we just talked about in the previous sections was exponential where our X was now up in the exponent and the B was a known value, our base. 
Well, then guess what we had to create to undo that? Something called the, what, Drew? Reciprocal? Oh, Drew, I tried to get Oh, it. you mean, oh, you mean, okay, my bad. <laughs> All good, buddy. What is it, inverse? Yeah. That's how we reverse things, right? And what they created was this thing called a logarithm. So that's why we're going over this now. And that's why these go hand in hand. Okay. It's just the undoing of one thing to another. We call the inverse. All right. So what they're going to tell us is what is the definition of a log? Okay. And again, we're just going to use the first three letters of a logarithm because that's a mouthful. Just like sine, cosine, tangent, we just chose the first three letters. Too many four-letter words out there. So they said, we'll just do three. Okay. So they're saying that this is equivalent to this. And what do you notice that looks like? Doesn't that look like an exponential function? Now, remember, our exponential function a minute ago was this. Y equals B to the X. And haven't we already talked about how to find the inverse in the previous unit? What did we do to find the inverse? There's the X and Y. Okay, Jenny. And if I switch the X and the Y, then I'd have X equals B to the Y. And if you notice, isn't that exactly what we have? And what are they saying that this is equivalent to? Log of B times X. Did I just prove to you that they are indeed inverses then? Logarithms and exponentials? Now, this is where a lot of people get confused, though, because they didn't understand it in high school when they were doing it in Algebra 2 or whatever class you were taking, right? They just had no idea what logs were. But guys, check it out. I'm going to give you the secret to all of logs. You ready? Come here, come close. No, I'm kidding. I'm not going to lie. Now I'm going to emphasize that logs are just blank in disguise. Now, I'm going to have you discover it so that it sticks with you. Go ahead, Jenny. What are you going to say? Exponents? I don't know. Why would you guess that? Because they're inverses, so they're technically the same. <laughs> Beautiful. Let me prove it to you right now, Jenny. Check it out. They're saying that this log right here, which is said log of this base this, okay? We read top to bottom. So the log of something base B is equal to Y. But it also said that it's equivalent to this. And notice, where is the y? As yeah. And this y and this y are the same. So what is a logarithm? It's simply just an exponent in disguise. It's just a different way to write exponents or these inverted exponential functions very good so how do we rewrite these things well we want to be able to go this direction and this direction so if you ever see an equation with a log wouldn't you rather have it in this form that we're a little bit more comfortable with most of the time Obviously, there is a reason that we have to go this direction and deal with logs too, okay? But we'll get there. And this is important for all of you that are taking calculus, okay? So make sure that you work hard on this unit. If I want to get rid of a log, what did we just get done saying we would have to do, Jenny? Make it an exponent. And you have to How? What's the one word I'm looking for? inverse very good drew is about to help you out he's like <laughs> i know it now the inverse so if you want to get rid of a log you just cross it out and you take the input 
and the output, the X and the Y, and you switch them. What's never going to change? Your base. But now it'll be B to the what? Y equals X. Do you guys see that? So again, whenever you see something like this, you know that you can just get rid of the log by dropping it and switching your X and your Y. What will never change? As I mentioned before, it's all about that base. That will help us to know whether it's an increasing or decreasing function, just like the exponentials. All right? So can we take a log of a negative number? No. And you'll see why when we start graphing. Okay? We'll talk about the equations of them. We'll get into a little bit more detail. We'll even talk about these things called common logs and natural logs. And since we're talking about bases with both exponential and logs, because they're inverses of each other, what is the most commonly used base in all of the world? I know we don't know because we live in America. And only us in one other small country called Burma, who actually changed their name because they can't even decide on the name, uses our terrible system. Actually, there's three. Is there another one? There's only three countries in the world that use Imperial. Although since Brexit, actually England is switching over to Imperial in the next few years. Really? They've always used Imperial and Metric. Um, is a special dispensation that EU gave them, but now that they're out of the EU, they're going. They're trying to switch back to met, um, only Imperial, which is really dumb. <laughs> Very, yeah. And in the seventies, eighties, they actually the U.S. government said, "You know what? Let's scrap this. Let's finally go and get on board with everyone else in the world and use the superior system we call the metric system, yep. which is all base what? Base ten. Base ten." because it's a lot easier to multiply and divide by 10 and just memorize a few prefixes. I could teach you guys the entire metric system in probably one hour. You wouldn't have a good feel for it, but you would be able to actually maneuver amongst it. But I've asked you guys before, how many feet are in a mile? 5,280. Good, only a handful of you would even know. And that's our system that we use. Right? How many pints are in a quart? How many cups are in a gallon? Right? It's just the system that we use is just dated, for lack of a better term. Okay? So the metric system, all you need to know is basically three on each side prefixes and then what you're dealing with. And it transcends along all of them meters for distance, liters for liquid, and then grams for pounds or uh, for measurements of weight, okay? We use ounces and pounds and all that fun stuff and it's a mess. So we are gonna use the most commonly used base. If we don't ever see a base there, it will be implied that it is base 10. Just like a square root, if we don't put a little number in that root, we know it's there. It's the most commonly used root, okay? So, what about the natural log? Well, this one's a little bit weird. The natural log, even though it's in and then an L, we're actually going to put L in. Because what are all of these things? Logarithms first. Okay? What if we use the natural number? Well, naturally, we will use that fancy number E as our base. And do you guys remember what E was about? A little less than three, two points. Very seven. good, very good. Remember pi was a little more than three, E was a little less than three. Excellent, all right? So if you ever see that L in, please, 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 do not put I in, okay? Because otherwise you're in trouble. Because when you type that, it will look like this. 
and it looks like LN. Okay, so please do not put that. I'll get a lot of people emailing me, why am I getting this wrong? Look, it looks exactly the same. Well, that is not equal to this because that is a capital I. It just looks like an L, lowercase. All right? So if I gave you some logs and I asked you to evaluate them, simplify them, you need to know that if they're giving you a log, what are they looking for? What kind of thing? What did I tell you logs are in disguise? Exponents. So if I was to rewrite this, remember, I would just get rid of the log. I'd keep my base of two, and then I'd switch the input and the output, which means I'd have two to the y, equals now on the other side, one over 32. And does everybody know what the answer is now? Do you know two to what power gives you one over 32? Negative eight. Close. If you don't know, remember the ones that we did in the previous section? we would try to get the base to be the same so that we could just concentrate on the exponents. And if you know that this is two to a power, then I would try to rewrite 32 as two to a power. And is that one of those that Drew was naming off? Negative four. Careful, it's actually five. Use your fingers if you have to. Two times two is four times two is eight, 16, 32, five of them, right? But I don't like the fact that it's down in my denominator. So to move it up, as Dustin mentioned, we'll have to make it negative to get to the opposite side of my division bar. And now I know that the bases are the same. I can concentrate on my exponents and there's my answer. So careful, look at the next one. That's nasty, isn't it? Unless you're looking at your bank account or a check, right? What's the base on this one if it's not listed? Either what or what? 10. Ten. Or? Never one. E. Very good. And how are we going to know if it's 10 or E? If it's L-O-G? Base L-N. 10. Very good. And if it's L-N, which stands for natural log, then natural E, we're going to use natural E, right? So naturally, we will use E when it's natural log. Okay? So this would be a base of 10. And since they're asking us to find the log of this, we're trying to find an exponent. So how would we say this to ourselves? My base to what power gives me my log? Does that make sense? If not, how do you always get rid of anything in math? You take the what, Drew? Inverse. I mean, I would get rid of the log by taking the input and the output and flip-flopping them. So now you can see on the right, it would be 10 to what power gives me that 1 million whatever. If I can... people in this class are too young for that reference. I know, right? <laughs> and if I get 10 to a power on both, then I can drop my basis and concentrate on the exponents, just like we did before. And because we don't deal with the metric system, might be a little bit harder to get that, but hopefully you know however many zeros follow that one is how many times you would multiply 10. 
So it'd be 10 to the six would give you a million, which means our answer is just six for our Y value. Is that kind of coming back a little bit? Next week will be a little bit more important as far as finishing up with logarithms, but of course we have to introduce them and we also want to make sure that we can graph them. So here's the last thing for today. Let's make sure that we can graph logarithms. Now, if we know how to graph y equals two to the x, which we did earlier, then shouldn't we be able to graph this? Because what is this to that? Inverse. That's it. And do you remember the line that we said would always be our mirror? Our reflection. The asymptote. Mm, close. The y. Let me let me. I'll I'll talk about the graph of this one first, and then we'll do it. What does this one look like? What kind of function is that? Is it a logarithm or an exponential? How can you exponential. tell? Exponential. How do you know it's not a log, Drew? Because the X is on top. Or how about there's no log, Drew? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that too. You were absolutely right in your answer. But the easier answer is there's no logarithm. Then it's not a log, right? But as your point was, yes, it's up in the exponent, my unknown, so it's exponential. And remember, exponential functions run along the X axis. And they go through that point zero, one whether they're increasing or decreasing. And what is this one? Increasing. Very good. There's the graph of that. That's how quick I would want you guys to be able to do it by the end of this week. Okay. Now, let me go back and answer that, uh, ask that question one more time. If this is the graph of my exponential with a pretty basic, easy base, and this has the same base, but it's now obviously a logarithm for the same reason that Drew and I were just giggling about. It has the log in it. What do we know this is to that? The inverse. And if we know that those are inverses of each other, do you remember when we were graphing inverses and their original function last unit? Do you remember the line that created the mirror image about our two inverse and regular functions? Is it the uh, vertical asymptote or? No asymptote. Uh, uh, okay. uh, the slope. Uh, the slant. Yeah. It's kind of like an axis of symmetry. It's kind of like an asymptote, but it is something a little bit more than that. Because if this is my original function over here, then because I know this line, y equals x, is the mirror to this and its inverse, then what do I have to do? I just got to take however many points I have and go ahead, Jenny. Switch to x and y's. That's it. Switch the X's and Y's. And what's the only point I'm telling you guys, I definitely want you to graph. You can do one or two more, but don't worry about doing too many. It'd be at one and zero now instead of zero and one. Beautiful. Now, wasn't there something else that I also graphed? I didn't write it down, but I did graph it. You'd have your ass until. Very good. And what was it, Dustin? 
Originally, it was y is equal to zero, but now it's going to be x is equal to zero. Because just like Jenny said, if we just switch for the inverse, all the x's and all the y's, all the inputs and all the outputs, then now I would have an asymptote of, and how do we tell if it's an increasing or decreasing function? If the base is positive or negative. Careful. Can't be negative, right. remember, if it's bigger than one or less than one, but not negative. So still greater than zero. Very good. And since this one was, and this one is, then this one too, in green here, should also be increasing. So from left to right, since this is the asymptote, I know I'm going to hit this and go that way. And can you guys see my beautiful butterfly? Can you see that reflection about that line? Y equals X. And why is it Y equals X? Do you guys remember? What's the inverse of Y equals X? X equals Y. It's the same thing, Jenny. Why are you repeating me? But no, you're absolutely right. That's why it's Y equals X for inverse function reflections. Pretty cool, Drew? Yep. Not too bad, right? No. So then help me out. What's the domain range and that asymptote equation for this logarithmic function? Oh, wait, you know what? Hold on. Before you answer that, do me a favor. Give me the domain range and asymptote equation that we should already know. Negative infinity to infinity and zero to infinity. Negative infinity to infinity, all that would be covered on our X. Very good for the blue one, right? And then for the Y, it would go from there up. So not zero, but starting at zero on up. What was the equation of the asymptote? Y is equal to zero. You know what? Do me a favor then. Based off of this only, tell me what this would be. Zero to infinity, negative infinity to infinity, x is equal to zero. How'd you get that so dang quick, Dustin? Domain is left to right, range is up or down to up. <laughs> I didn't need that. It's just inversed. Domain yeah, because they're inverse. inverse. Yeah. Very good. Very good. And that's my point. Very good. Ginny told us that it would just be everything switched. So since these are all the X's and Y's inputs and outputs, if I just flip-flop those, that will be this. As will be the Y equals zero will now become X equals zero for our asymptote. So just a reminder, exponential functions run along the X axis for your asymptote logarithms come from trees so they run straight up and down easy enough exponential x-axis logs straight up and down like a tree right zero one or one zero but of course what will we do to these as we did those shift them stretch them reflect them do all yoga things, okay? So there's that that I just went over, a lot cleaner. Wanted to show you that. And here are all of the attributes, characteristics that we just went over as well. So if you wanna pause it and write it down, by all means do. Otherwise, the one thing that we did not go over were the intercepts. But of course, we've gone over that many times in the previous unit let the other letter equal zero. So to wrap, what I'm going to make sure that you guys do is instead of using this, my suggestion is to use this. A times the log of X minus H plus K with our base B. And if you can tell me what all of those variables change or represent, 
then you are doing phenomenal. The main things you should know are that H and that K, because that's no different than all those other functions that we did in the last unit. This will still be our shift opposite for the X and same for the Y. The base is gonna tell us increasing or decreasing based on the number one, right? Bigger than one increasing, less than one decreasing. And that A is going to be our stretching or reflecting, whether it's positive or negative. Okay, so there it is all in a nutshell. If you guys wanna do an example, we can. Totally up to you. Otherwise, we can go ahead and call it good for today. You guys wanna do this one? Yeah, please. Sure. Yep. Should be yeah. pretty quick, right? Let's do it. What kind of function do you know this is? Log. What gave it away? Log. Now, the only one that's a little bit harder to see is when they put ln. It's generous. Okay? So be careful. The ln means now we have a base of what? Ten. Careful. E. Natural E. Natural E, right? LOG is just going to be that basic 10 that we were talking about with metric. With uh, E, is there ever going to be a point where instead of just putting E, we would actually put the 2.718? Not usually. Unless they want us to evaluate something with E, then yes, absolutely. And there is something on here that hopefully you can see. It's the from the bottom left on mine, third one up. It's in yellow. So if I put E to the first, you can see there's that number, 2.718-ish. Okay? So if you ever have to evaluate something, then yes, but otherwise, we like exact numbers better. So we'll just leave it as E if we can. Great question. So because we know it's a log, we know it's going to be running up and down. So I'm going to graph my... Asymptote, remember, I always want to watch my asymptote before I start graphing this thing, okay? Because I don't want to get in trouble. And that means I'm going to start at one zero. And all I got to figure out is if it's increasing or decreasing and how do we do that? The coefficient of the base. Good. It's all about that base. And because it's a two, it's bigger than one, it's going to increase. For every x, it's going to increase and get larger. So I know that my original function is going to look something like this. What are we going to do to that now that we've taken care of it? I'm going to do all the other stuff that's there, which this means, and this means we're going to shift what? Left two, down five. Good. Negative two negative five or left to down five as Brian stated so eloquently in words. I like using symbols because it's less. Very good. Now, remember guys, what are we shifting left to and down five? Looking for one word here. Vertex. That is one word. <laughs> but is that the only thing that you're going to shift, Jenny? The asymptote. Okay, then now that's two words. And you're not wrong, by the way. But how can you tell me in one word? Inverse. <laughs> Everything. That's the bottom line, right? The bottom line is what do they want us to do? They want us to take this graph. And they want us to shift it, all of it, left two and down five. But like you said, what should we shift first? Vertex. Shift that asymptote before you shift that vertex point. Okay? Get your borderline so that you know where you're going to be drawing your graph. 
And the only reason I ask you guys to do the asymptote first is because a lot of people will mess that up. Okay. And then we'll take that vertex point, that starting point. And that's the only point I really care that you graph. If you want to do more, it'll be more exact. Totally up to you. Okay. So I'm going to start by shifting my asymptote left two. And then down five. Because it's going up and down, does it really matter that I shifted it down five? No, that's not going to really play a part in my asymptote shift. But then I'm going to have to take this point and I'm going to have to shift it left two and down five. So again, be careful when you do that. Because what a lot of people will make the mistake is they will skip right over this tick mark. They go right over the X or Y axis. They don't even count it. That is a tick mark. That is a value, you guys. So don't just go from here and go left two and then down five. You cannot touch the asymptote. It's a borderline. Okay. Don't ever put a point on it. That's what we border or approach. Okay. So again, just be careful. Left two down one, two, three, four, five. Plot your point. And then from there, what do we say it was going to be? What kind of graph? Increasing. And it's as if we took all of these values and went left to down five, left to down five, left to down five, everywhere. Should be able to circle this, pick it up, move it left to down five and put it right on top of it. Does that make sense? All right. The reason why people have a lot of issues with the shifting with the uh, with these is because the last chapter was probably used to everybody was shifting from zero, huh? Yes, exactly. As I mentioned before, a lot of people will start at the origin and they will shift left to down five. And then, so that's why I tell you guys to put your asymptote down first. And then hopefully you know, well, I can't be there. Something's off. And that's because remember, if it's a log, it's right one. If it's exponential, it's up one. That's that starting point, either one zero or zero one. Yep, great point. Um, is there an example that you can give us with the uh, with E? Thought you'd never ask. So if anybody would like to see one more, we'll do this. I did throw in some extra parts in front just in case to add that as well. But again, remember this LN looks like a capital I or a one even if you typed it out. Just know that that is an L, which is why whenever I write it, I do a cursive to emphasize. It's still a logarithm. It just has a base what. Don't be afraid of it, even though you all said E. Okay, it's not a big deal. So let's do the original graph then. My y equals natural log of x. That is my original function. Since it's a log, we're going to build our house straight up and down with that log. We're going to have that point one zero with our log. And all we have to figure out is what the base is to tell us whether it's increasing or decreasing. And Jenny, you've been saying it quite often today. What do we know E is about? Less than three, little less than three. Which means increasing or decreasing. Same. Decreasing? Nope. And I knew you were gonna say that because you're thinking less than three, but remember our barometer is to one. Mm. We're always going to measure to the easiest thing, and that's one. Okay, very good. So since E is three-ish, then it's going to even go a little faster than our other one that we just did. But like I said, guys, I'm not too worried about that. Okay, I'm not worried about the exactness of your graph. I'm more worried about some of the details of it. 
So that is what we have here, and we need to change it. And there are a few things going on here, aren't there? But Dustin, that's the big difference, but don't let the natural log throw you. I mean, it, that's really it right there. All this other stuff, same as all the other ones, right? It's just that base that changes things. We got the plus one, the minus three, the negative, and the one half. We got to take care of all of that. Which of those four things do you guys want to take care of first? Shifting would be easiest to start with. I agree, which is why I'm going to leave it till the end. Does that make sense, Brian? Yeah. You're absolutely right. And most people will try to do that first. But then what about this stuff here? Well, then that's going to be even harder once we've already moved it around and set it back down, right? Yeah. Yeah, so very good. I would do this first, that second, and then these last. We got the original graph. We know what it looks like. Now we're going to apply the negative and the one half, which what is that going to affect? Is it being done inside with the X? No. Very good, which means what is it going to affect? The Ys. And how? It's going to... What is the negative going to do? It's going to mirror along the y axis. Or, Careful. Sorry, x. It's going to, um, x, x is equal to zero. Good. And y, because it's affecting the y's. So it's going to go on the opposite side from my y's of the x. Very good. I know that's what you meant. Got a little mixed with your words there. And then what about the one half? Well, let's, let's take care of this first. Presses it. See that? See how all my Y's went to the opposite side? Now, for me, it's really easy. If I wanted to do this, gone. Right? For you guys, it's probably a little bit harder to do. But there's my next step. And then what is that one half going to do? Dustin, you said compress. Compress what? Uh, compress the... Uh the lines how far they are from their my x's or my y's your in this case it's going to compress the y's very good it's not inside with the x so it's going to affect the y's remember y's are y's we do what they say it's going to take this and compress it down it's going to make all those y values half as big as they normally would be now are you going to see that a ton on your graph nah not really not when this is shooting up here and going down here to infinities, right? But what would it look like? It'd be a little bit slower to get there. Is that drawn perfectly? No. Does yours have to be? No. I, all I care is that you kind of know what that means, okay? So, again, be careful with that. Now, do you see why we wanted to wait to do our shifting? Would have been a whole lot harder to reflect things about our axes if our axes are moved. Okay. But very good, Brian. Now, what are we going to do? Shift it. <laughs> How? Left one and down three. Yep. Beautiful. Remember when that used to be a challenge for us? Like, wait, what? Why did you? Now that's the easy part, right? And again, careful. What are we going to shift first? Asymptote. And then what? Vertex. Vertex. Beautiful. So my asymptote, I will shift left one and down three. Well, since it runs up and down, the down three isn't going to really affect it. If I asked you to give me the asymptote, what would it be? X equals negative one. Beautiful. Well done. That sounds familiar, by the way. And then what? Take my vertex and let me get rid of the ones that don't matter. I will take that green one, which was our last one that we kind of manipulated and shift it. 
left one, and then down three. Plot my point, draw it. And that, my friends, would be my final answer. I'm trying to use a different color here. They asked for the domain and range and all that stuff. You should be able to tell me, even if I asked for the X or Y intercepts, you should be able to find and or tell me. Quick domain. Negative, Negative one. one to infinity. Mm -hmm. Very good. Not including either of those values. Range. All reals. Good. Or negative to positive infinity. Excellent. Asymptote. Y or X equals negative one. Good. We got that one already. How about the Y intercept? Zero comma to negative, th negative three. Beautiful. And how would we find the X intercept if they asked for it? Just plug three, negative three into four Y. Careful. Always zero for it, right? And we know it's somewhere between zero and negative one, but it's probably not going to be very nice. Okay. Well done.